pathologies that you've ever had. Um, first, we'd just like to a quick word of thanks to our Minister for Housing, Local Government and Heritage, Tara O'Brien, uh, to Tim Carey, Sean Hogan, Jerry Shannon, all in the Custom House for their support and uh, help, not just this year, but down the years. Now, our talk tonight is presented by Cathy Scuffle. For us Dubliners and for anyone of you know, who knows her, she is one of our own. She's got an unrivaled passion for the city, its history and its place in history. Cathy is Dublin born and reared. Her interest in local history was formed at an early age and encouraged by her parents who shared their love of Dublin with her. Cathy has been deeply and enthusiastically involved in her local area and in 1986 she was honorary secretary for the and founder member of the Dolphins Barn Historical Society. She compiled and edited their first publication by the sign of the Dolphin in 1993. As she has worked hard to hone and expand her skills over the years, and in addition to an honours business and management degree, she holds both a certificate and a master's in local history from the National University of Ireland in Maynooth. A master's thesis, uh, the research for that was published by the Four Courts Press as the South Circular Road Dublin on the eve of the First World War. And her accompanying talk uh, was awarded the silver medal by the Old Dublin Society in 2018. Now, I first met Cathy when she was so actively involved in a wide range of community events during the 1916 Rising Centenary Commemorations, researching the Rialto Kilmainham 1916 Commemoration Photographic Exhibition and the publication 1916 in the South Dublin Union for St. James's Hospital. And I was almost overwhelmed by her enthusiasm and genuine desire to help everyone who asked for it. So it is such a pleasure to see that she is currently working as historian in residence with Dublin City Council uh, for the South Central area, where almost every day or so, the South Circular Road, um, the, uh, in addition, she has in her spare time, she's a consultant historian for other projects. Now, Cathy's talk for us uh, now is about an event that occurred after the burning of the Custom House and just before the truce. The period when, according to some, the IRA was decimated by the loss of so many men in the Custom House attack. But as Cathy will show, after the burning, uh, the Dublin Brigade IRA continued its attacks against the Crown forces undaunted. Shifting the focus now to attacking military supplies and infrastructure, the IRA pr proved it was capable of carrying on the conflict and continuing to bring the fight to the enemy. The last major engagement undertaken by the Dublin Brigade uh, was on 8th of July 1921 when a train carrying troops, military supplies, horses and civilians was ambushed as it passed under the railway bridge near what was then a uh, rural hamlet of Ballyfermot. It was carried out by members of the 4th Battalion ASU, some of whom uh, ha had been involved in the Custom House attack. It occurred just hours before the formal announcement that the truce had been called marked the end of the War of Independence. So hand over to you now, Cathy, and we look forward to hearing your talk. Great, thank you very much, Michal, uh, and a huge thank you to yourself and to Liz for making all the arrangements for tonight, and indeed in the build-up to this. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, uh, and an honour, a real honour to be here and to be part of the commemoration of the burning of the Custom House and bring my little bit of the story to it as well. So if you bear with me for one moment, I'll just share my screen and I'll have the presentation starting in just a couple of moments. Uh, can you give me a thumbs up? That's, I'm sure that's come across okay. Uh, thank you all very much. So, continuing the, the fight unhindered, the Ballyfermot train ambush. And like everything else, you have to give a bit of a context, give it its background, and work out uh, how the story came about as such. Um, as you're, you, you have to really set the scene and understand where we're talking about. So if we just take the area of Ballyfermot for a moment, this is what it looks like today. Thanks to Google Maps and all, all the new technology we have, Ballyfermot is a busy suburb, quite near the city centre really, but a very, very busy suburb of Dublin, located to the west, 
very self-sufficient area, um, multi-generational families in the area now, and very much a suburban setting. It's only been that suburban setting in the last 70 years or so, when the Bally Firm, as we know it today, has actually uh, there are key locations, even within this aerial photograph, that are elements of the past. So, in a sense, we can nearly pick out field patterns when we look at this particular aerial photograph. But most importantly of all, we can pick out the main route of the canal and the railway running through um, our image here in, in the aerial photograph that we have of Ballyfermot. So, to take us back, this is what it would have looked like way back a um, hundred years ago. The area of Ballyfermot was very, very rural, but there were hamlets, there were groups of people, cottages, farms dotted around the area. The key employers, and this is very much reflected by um, the, the, when you look at the census records, even for the time, and, and you can see what's dominating the area. The railway works here at Inchicore. I'm just moving the cursor across the screen now. There's the railway works at Inchicore. Again, we have our uh, railway line and canal dominating the images here in the, um, the, the aerial, the map shot that we, we have up. But you can see very much that it's a rural hamlet. Uh, it, all the areas, every square there is a field. And there's something going on just at this particular point. And I'm using this as a location so that people can really understand the setting that we're talking about as we work our way through the talk. So you can see here, Ballyfermot Castle. There's a church mark. There's, a, there's actually a trig mark on the map as well. So that indicates a mound of some description. And there's a number of houses in this area too. This was the site of Ballyfermot Castle, the graveyard and the church. It, this is what it would have looked like. And uh, uh, as time went on, the church was very, very much in ruin. Now, to tell you exactly where that is, most people of the Ballyfermot area can point it out by telling you it's in the lawns park. So that very, very large park that we have at that part of Ballyfermot, that is actually exactly where Ballyfermot Castle and Church were located. Just up from it, we have a railway line. And this is the main railway line heading down towards the Curra, Clondalk and next stop up, coming out of Inchicore, coming out of Houston Station. This is the line that came across there, still there today. But this is what it would have looked like back 100 years ago absolutely rural setting, the undulating embankment, the remnants of digging out the original railway line through the area itself, and the bridge standing in perfect isolation in the, in the area. Some people would call it Killeen. It's that part of Ballyfermot. Our castle and church would be just off screen, off to the right. So you can see what the area would have looked like. This was pure countryside the minute you left the city. While I have that picture up, I just want to particularly mention the Ballyfermot Heritage Group, who have been unbelievably helpful in, in making images available. Because when you're trying to put a talk together, you really are reliant on local history and heritage groups. And it's been an absolute pleasure working with them over the years. So on this, I just mentioned Ken Larkin for his help in putting this talk together. Further up from this bridge is another one, and this is the bridge that goes over the canal. So it's known as the Seventh Up Bridge. We would have had a pub there. So we have a pub, we have a railway line, and we have fields, we have small little hamlets, small cottages, a rural setting, very much so, and only changed with the coming of the Ballyfermot suburb that we have in, uh, has been developing in the last 70 plus years or thereabouts. I did a quick check on the 1911 census just to get a sense of what were people working at in the area. There, there was a population there, all set in a rural landscape, all living in cottages, some attached to farms, things like that. And primarily, they returned themselves as farmers, labourers or dairymen. But we have a group of people living in this community too, 
and mill workers that are heading out to Killeen would have gone over the bridges at Ballyfarm with the railway line and the one further up on the canal, bringing up to the big mills up at Killeen near Clondalkin and also the other mills that were located in around Bluebell area of Dublin, the, the Camac uh, mills were located there too. And a lot of people had worked with the waterworks because the canal unusually was siphoned off at different stretches along the canal and uh, the water supplies that were providing them for industrial purposes inside the city. So the regulation of that water uh, provided a significant amount of employment too. And you find quite a number of people in Ballyfermot having an association with the waterworks. But far beyond all this are the group that are working in those railway works at Inchicore. And behind all of this is an entire area closely associated with the 4th Battalion IRA. It's part of that whole network for the 4th Battalion, and it's a key part in this particular story. Again, just an image of our rural valley farm, which feels as far as you can see. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to get images like this because it's hard to set the scene. But if you have images like this, they certainly do help. So let's look at Ireland 100 years ago. What, what were we talking about? What was it like? So in the lead up to the time span we're speaking about, we're recovering from the 1916 rising. It's still a talking point. It's still very much in the local psyche. The anti-conscription campaign had ended because World War I was over. So a lot of things had come to an end. Uh, so the, the world was moving on. As soon as the war was over, a general election was called. It was eight years since we had one. In the St. James's division in the city centre, uh, Joe McGrath is elected. In the St. Patrick's Division, adjacent to St. James's, and this is the one closely associated with the liberties of Dublin, Countess Markovic has been elected. The first woman to be elected to a parliament anywhere in the first election that women had the vote. Those two areas together, the St. James Division and the St. Patrick's Division, today we'd more or less equate to the area we know as Dublin South Central today, the, the political area, the electoral area of Dublin South Central. On the 21st of January 1919, the first doll was held in the Mansion House in Dublin. And the two people that I have mentioned, Joe McGrath and the Countess Markovic, were Feigloss Egolov, or imprisoned by the foreigners. So neither of them were actually there. They were in jail. So it even gives you an idea of the people who had been elected to this doll. On the same day as the first doll is heard, the War of Independence starts. The official um, agreement, uh, you know, it's a, a date that's used to denote the beginning of the War of Independence. Some may argue it had been happening uh, before that, but let's take it as it is. We'll connect it to Salahed Beg, County Tipperary, when two RIC constables were killed in the ambush in the, near the quarries uh, there. And this marks the start of the War of Independence in Ireland. Part of this War of Independence, as we work our way through it, and one of the things that would have been a talking point in the rural hamlets around Ballyfermot, Bluebell, Inchicore, that part of Dublin, would be these sporadic incidents that had been happening. Here's one, the uh, attempted mining of the Crumman village RIC barracks, which had happened on the 8th of October, 1920. They actually mined the building, but it went slightly wrong because as they were exiting and the fire had begun, they hear shouting from inside and realized that one of the volunteers was actually trapped in the building at the time. He's rescued, but he's badly burnt and brought to Flood's house on the Nace Road, where a doctor was brought to attend to him. The reason I mention this is to show you that it's rural County Dublin, so the RIC barracks is part of the story, but certainly Flood's house at Bluebell is also part of our story. The Flood sisters were very, very well known uh, because their house provided a safe haven. It was a safe house in this 
whole time of the War of Independence. They're also very generous to St. Patrick's Athletic because they provided a field attached to their farm near the Nace Road for St. Patrick's Athletic to play on. So they're very, very much part of the whole wider community and very much part of whatever was happening. This was the place you could go to. Flood's house at Bluebell wasn't too far away from Ballyfermot. It's just over the canal from the area in question. Here's actually uh, details from um, uh, witness statements because we are heavily uh, reliant on the witness statements from putting these stories together. And this is one by Joe Kinsler, who was the intelligence officer for the 4th Battalion IRA, his statement relating to the time of 1921. And what's key here is that they worked in the Inchicore works. This is the railway works at Inchicore. Uh, needless to say, there didn't seem to be an awful lot of fixing up of trains going on, but certainly there's plenty going on about working in the moulding unit where they could actually make munitions and repair guns, uh, all part of the cause. The railway works uh, becomes part of the whole uh, machinery behind the War of Independence for the 4th Battalion. And um, they, they also hold their meetings in the nearby Emmet Hall and Emmet Hall was on Emmet Road, very close to Richmond Barracks. They're holding their meetings there, right beside a British military installation. Basically, in plain sight, these meetings were taking place. Another act of defiance behind all of that was going on during the War of Independence. And you can see that they're using whatever they can Munitions are hard to come by. You have to find other ways of supplying people. The War of Independence goes on much longer than the 1916 Rising had. So munitions and armaments are a huge problem throughout it. The Inchicore works, again, Joe Kinsley explains in his uh, statement, it was being raided about on average once a fortnight by the British and they never found anything. They even put a military post consisting of about six or eight men there at all times. And still, they found nothing. In the foundry department, they found they could make grenades. In fact, they were doing anything up to 36 grenades a day in the foundry. Needless to say, they got better and better at it. And, and then he said, after a while, when they were doing it, they found they could now make up to 40 or 50 grenades a week. So I wasn't joking when I said they weren't really fixing trains in the Inchicore works. This was part of the machinery behind the whole cause all through the War of Independence. Another talking point would have been this bloody Sunday the previous November. And this is a turning point, a serious turning point in the War of Independence itself. Bloody Sunday happened on the 21st of November, 1920. One of the victims of Bloody Sunday was this lad, Joe Trainer. Joe Trainer was from Ballymount Cottages. In rural areas, all of these hamlets were interconnected. Joe Trainer was buried in Bluebell Cemetery. Bluebell Cemetery was easily accessible from Killeen across through Bluebell and just in the whole general area that we're speaking about. A big, big talking point would have been the fact that a local lad had lost his life in Croke Park on the 21st of November, 1920. And you can see an image there of his grave in Bluebell Cemetery, and it was beautifully decorated by his family members uh, to commemorate uh, Bloody Sunday last year. We get accounts then of transport raids. These become a, a, a big issue. They're, they realise that it is more important to hit the machinery of the British military almost as much as to hit the military themselves. So for example, bricks and mortar were being brought from the brickworks at Dolphins Barn. That, they would have been located at the Crumlin Shopping Centre on the Crumlin Road. It's held up. The drivers were ordered to drive to the Kimmage Quarry and the lorries were actually driven into the quarry itself. That's Eamon Park on Sundrive Road today. 
The next day, the British authorities returned and they managed to retrieve one lorry from the quarry. So someday there'll be an archaeological dig up in, our, in Sundrive Park and a lorry is going to give itself up. And now we know where it came from. Here's another incident at Bluebell on the Nace Road. Again, this wouldn't have been far from Flood's farm. Two British dispatch motorcyclists were held up and their bicycles, their motorcycles and the dispatches were taken. And these are handed over to the volunteer unit in South Dublin. This is the type of activity that's taking place all around the area, hijacking the military lorries. Say the bricks and mortar that I mentioned there were being brought out to construct Baldonnell. It's the main road out to Baldonnell. So that whole route becomes a target all through the War of Independence itself. Now, there was one incident on the bridge that I came across, and this is one, sometimes it gets confused with the one that we're going to discuss in a few minutes. This is an attack on the RIC constables, uh, Sergeant Hallisey and Mulrooney and Constable Neil. Uh, the account from the newspaper uh, tells us that it happened in Ballyferm near Chapelizard. So when you're in a rural area, you're using the landmarks that you have. Uh, the, the killed and wounded men were members of a small cycling patrol said to have been proceeding from Dublin to Lucan. The point where the shooting occurred was, as the paper uh, reminds us, only two miles west of Dublin. Following that ambush, immediately there's retaliation and this constantly happened. Most of the houses in Clondalkin were searched by the Crown Forces and then many houses in, in the Inchicore district, again, were raided. Now, raids would have had a, a, a huge impact on the local area. They, you know, having your hall door kicked in probably in the early hours of the morning and the house ransacked, that leaves a very lasting memory in families and is recounted as part of the folklore of a family in close-knit communities like those in Clondalkin, those in Inchicore, those in the Liberties area of Dublin, these stories are still told today. It's stated that the employees at the Inchicore Railway Works were questioned and searched, and that would have been quite normal by, uh, by all accounts up to now. And the castle then, when it issued its uh, report later that evening, said the cycle patrol of RIC consisted of the head constable and three other police was ambushed at Ballyfermot. Um, Sergeant Hallisey was killed. And they say in the newspaper account that the other two constables were seriously injured. And that came from the Freeman's Journal. However, always good to look at these things and back them up with something else. And here I have from one of the witness statements uh, giving us an account of the fact that the volunteers of the company were actively involved in seizing British military transport, as I had ex explained to you um, just in the previous slide. But here we get a background to what was going on. On this occasion, a military transport had been taken and brought up to Bluebell near the Nugget factory. Now, some people might know Nugget Cottages in Bluebell, um, you certainly have heard the word nugget before. You know your nugget boot polish. That's what the Camock Mills had actually turned into. It was a, a boot polish factory. The lorries brought up into this rural landscape near the mills and destroyed by burning. And the RIC men came out to investigate the, the smoke on the horizon as such. They saw them in the area and they decided they'd attack them uh, in a position near the railway bridge. And as they were heading for Lucan, the witness statement states that two were killed and they wounded one. In actual fact, one died later in hospital. So the account of the witness statement is stronger than the actual newspaper accounts of the time. I also managed to get the military uh, detail of this and it just shows you that they, they were, each, each statement contradicts the other slightly. So you find that um, they, they were actually patrolling the whole area as much uh, as watching for events that were going on. Tensions were running really, really high a hundred years ago in the whole general area that was covered by the 4th Battalion. 
And again, just to show you, this is a great picture I found in the city archive, and there's no denying what that building is because they're in great letters across the roof, the Nugget Booth Polish. They couldn't fit the word factory, but I think it's self-explanatory. And um, this is where the Camac Park is today, not too far from the other bridge into Ballyferm at the modern one at, K at Kylemore. But you can see at this time, that whole area has been laid out for housing and road widening as the images show. And that's probably why the City Archive had this actually actual picture uh, on their file. But I was delighted to find it and I'm really pleased to include it. And of course, this is where the military transport was actually burnt on that night. I also managed to get a picture of uh, Head Constable Mulrooney's um, funeral. And this was held in the north of Ireland, which you can see that the streams of people attending the funeral. Every single one of these incidents would have had a major impact on people's thought processes and sense of safety or unsafety, if you like, in this environment that we're talking about. Now, since Bloody Sunday, the IRA regrouped. They had lost quite a number of men in the roundup after Bloody Sunday, and they introduce a new tactic. They take on the tactic of attacking trains. In 1920, there'd been incidents at Mill Street in County Cork. There was more in um, Doro Station and Bally Lynch level crossing in Waterford. The Headford Junction in Killarney all around that part of Ireland, there were so many incidents taking place. But then it started to gather momentum. And we had incidents at Upton and Limerick and Armagh, Ennis. It just kept going. In Dublin, notably, there were incidents at Drumcondra and also at Colester. And of course, Ballyfermot. So what happened? We're back to our bridge again. So... On the 8th of July, 1921, it's decided they're going to ambush a troop train. We're going to look at who was involved, what did they do, and where did they do it? So I've set the scene of where they did it. The rural bridge out in Ballyfermot, the railway bridge, as after you've left the Inchicore Works, railway line, railway bridge, and it's just fields and meadows after that. Who was involved? Well, it's actually the Dublin Brigade Active Service Unit. Now, this is a photograph that Liz very kindly sourced for me. And this is taken probably about 20, um, 20 30 years after the actual incident. Imagine these, these are all in photograph, you can see they're mainly middle-aged men. At the time of the ambush in Ballyfermot, these would have been 20-year-olds, 21-year-olds, 22-year-olds, young men. This is an elite unit. It's an elite unit that had been formed after November 1920. Before that, it was volunteer groups. So you found your ambushes taking place, say, at lunchtime or in the evening time, when they, when they came home from the day job as such. The ASU are slightly different. They're more of a full-time active service unit. The mass arrests after Bloody Sunday had a, a huge effect on the, the ranks of the volunteers. It was completely depleted. And the authorities pretty much thought they were winning because they had rounded up so many of them and sent them off to uh, various internment camps. Uh, a lot of them went up to Ballykindler up in County Down. So this is why the IRA go for this full-time ASU. They set it up similarly to the one that they had in Cork. So it's... Uh, it, it's it set up along the battalion lines. So we had an ASU uh, one and number one and number two. They're based on the north side, pretty much ma matching the, the first and second battalion. The third and fourth then, of course, are matching the battalions on the south side. And then there's a fifth one. They're the engineer group. They're dispatched wherever they're needed. 
number four, of course, is connected with the 4th Battalion, and that covers the area in Shakur, Ballyferm, Dolphins Barn, Thomas Street, the Liberties, all of that part of Dublin, very much synonymous with what we call South Central today. The originally, the original thought about the active service unit was to have them under the control of um, the IRA directly um, in, in an official capacity. So if you were going to do take any action, it would have to be approved at that level. However, that sort of died out after a while because all of these were guerrilla actions and they were taken pretty much, they would make a local decision, they knew what they could do locally and they had to take action pretty quickly. Uh, so it, it sort of fizzles out as such. Uh, it really wasn't feasible to control it very centrally. The main thing about them, of course, is that they're going to take the fight to the enemy. So you can see there, just done a general summary of what I was talking about uh, a few moments ago. So this is the Active Service Union. Who are the key people? Well, key number one is this gentleman. This is Porrick O'Connor. He's the F Company 4th Battalion. He's the number four section of the ASU. And later he becomes the second lieutenant of the active service unit. I'd be delighted uh, and like to acknowledge this photograph from his nephew Dermot. He's in uh, very actively involved in the in all of the actions that seem to take place in this part of Dublin. By the time of the troop um, troop train ambush at Ballyfermit, he's the second lieutenant in charge um, of that particular operation. Who's with them? Well, here's some of the people involved. We've got Joan McGuinness there, you can see again, 4th Battalion. Uh, we also have uh, George Nolan. And the other one from the 4th Battalion is Lawrence Martha uh, there at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Pat McRae, he is actually uh, from B Company of the 2nd Battalion, and he's also involved in the squad. So he's involved in this action, and there's a particular reason for that, which we we'll mention in a couple of moments. He, he is also the driver for this event, so that makes him very important uh, in the ambush story itself. We also have Lawrence Martha, I mentioned him there. Uh, his photograph is at the bottom of the screen, and most of them on the screen here are 4th Battalion. And in addition to this, these are the volunteers that are involved. James or Jimmy McGuinness, and he's the man who actually has the Thompson submachine gun on the day. Another thing that's a key feature of the ambush in Ballyfermot. Other people there are Edward Byrne, Patrick Lanigan, uh, Liam Keane, Daniel Jevons, he's also ASU, Michael Carroll, and Michael J. Stack, and uh, Michael J. Stack, we have one or two accounts from him um, as part of his particular witness statements of this particular uh, event. George Nolan, he is uh, the, uh, the he, he notes that the tactic now is actually to um, uh, attack the trains. Remember we mentioned that earlier, that it would be about if they had moved it up to um, attacking the trains. And here he sees, he mentions in his actual witness statement that orders were sent to the section commander, who is, of course, Pori McConnor, that a troop train would be proceeding from Dublin to the Curra on a certain morning and that it was to be attacked at Ballyfermot. So now we know exactly the background to the event and the people involved. Who's the target? Well, the target is the, um, the Gordon Highlanders. Now, the Gordon Highlanders are actually one of the groups of military that have now been brought into Ireland by the British establishment. The problem is the depletion in the ranks of the Irish regiments. Post-World War I, it was no longer fashionable to be 
a member of the British Army. By necessity, a lot of people still were involved, but let's say the enthusiasm had gone out of the whole thing. So now Britain is faced with this difficulty of how to actually manage Ireland. And the only way of doing it is by bringing in her troops from other regiments who wouldn't normally have been serving in Ireland. On this particular day, it's the Gordon Highlanders who are going to be on the train that's heading out from Houston. It's expected that they're heading south, where they're really needed down around Cork and Limerick area. Uh, but they're one of a number of many British Army units which were now being deployed as the Irish situation was, was really hotting up and becoming quite significant at the time. And what's the plan? Well, again, if we go to one of the people that we met earlier, George Nolan, he tells us this a fairly simple plan. Three men were to take tins of petrol from a pony and car. So remember, the means of transport at this time were pony and cart, bicycle and walking. The men were to bring along with pieces of sacking. So we have petrol, tins of petrol and pieces of sacking. The sacks were to be saturated with the petrol and thrown on top of the carriages as this particular train would pass under the railway bridge. One man in our party, armed for the first time with a Thompson submachine gun, this is another thing that makes the whole story of Ballyfermot quite significant. He was to spray the tops of the carriages with fire and light the saturated petrol sacks. George also tells us that they took up position as ordered. Four of them were on the bridge and Jimmy McGuinness with the Thompson submachine gun was one of them. The remainder of the section were at both sides of the railway behind the embankment. So you remember earlier on, we saw how undulating the sides of the railway were, probably going back to when it was originally dug out. The Thompson submachine gun was uh, significant, and there's a couple of other little things in this story that bear highlighting. For example, I did mention that ammunition was a problem. So this is where the ASU, the IRA, became very inventive. Fire was a weapon too. So this is where we get the petrol and the sacking, something that we can set on fire. It's as good as a bullet. They had the guns, but they may not necessarily have had the ammunition. And this is a huge problem now, at this, certainly at this stage in the War of Independence. They had their grenade factories. We know that from what we saw earlier, in, particularly in the Inchicore works. Um, the whole 4th Battalion are heavily involved in all of this manufacturing of grenades, of finding ways of using new um, means of taking the fight to the enemy. So fire is a key weapon here. The Thompson submachine gun was very important to the IRA. Uh, these would have come from America and it's funded by Han Gael. At this particular time, the one that's out at the bridge in Ballyfermot is only one of two that were available to the IRA at the time. The Thompsons had actually been trialled out in the casino in Marino to see how effective they were in the tunnels underneath the casino there in Marino. The IRA had ordered 500. They hadn't come um, at that stage. Um, I think a number of them were actually impounded before they actually got here. Who are the five men on the bridge? We've actually been able to identify them. Porrick O'Connor is on the bridge. Along with Michael J. Stack, Joe McGuinness, George Nolan, and Jimmy McGuinness with the Thompson gun. So now we have the perfect setting as this train leaves. The supported, supported men are all in this embankment area on the other side of the bridge. So they're hiding behind those little hillocks and hiding behind the embankment itself. And they're all uh, armed with their own handguns. Again, you can see how rural the whole landscape is. 
Taking it from Michael J. Stark's um, witness statement, he describes the ambush uh, in great detail. Just to bring us in, he, sp he starts this story there by the mentioning the fact that Jimmy McGuinness is on the bridge with his Thompson gun. His description is quite telling. The remainder of the section took up positions on the bank of the railway line. When the train, which we were expecting, we know they were expecting it, it passed Inchicore, a signal went up. So this train is being watched the whole way out from Houston. There would have been eyes in Houston. There would have been eyes in Inchicore. There were eyes in Ballyfermot, letting the lads know the train is on the way. This is in the days long before we had mobile phones and, and such things. When the train entered the tunnel at Ballyfermot, Michael Stack is the one who pours the petrol onto the roof of the train. Porrig O'Connor lights the sacks on the petrol soaked roof and McGuinness opened fire with the Thompson gun as the train emerged from the tunnel. The section on the bank open fired with their revolvers as the train went through. By this time, the train was well ablaze. The grenade men then came into action and by the accounts in the witness statements, they say the casualties were heavy on the British that day. So the account is quite graphic, quite descriptive, but we can see it from the setting and the build up that we've had to the top tonight. It's reported in the papers and, and Liz very kindly sourced these from the Leinster leader. And again, you can see train bombed. So the, the effect of the grenade is, is, is hugely important on this as well. There is a civilian casualty mentioned in the newspaper reports and several people were also injured on the day. General Military Headquarters at Dublin, in an official report, gave a statement to the newspaper and here we have it backed up that it contained a party of the Gordon Highlanders. It was bombed and fired between Clondalk and Inchicore. We know exactly where, the bridge in Ballyfermot. Several civilian passengers were wounded, one of them very seriously. The explosions of the bombs and the sharp rattle of the machine gun and rifle fire were heard distinctly over a very, very wide area. In a rural setting, anything happening on that railway line would have been heard. Bluebell, Glendalken, Ballyfermot itself. We get a further description of the bullets of the attacking party. How about this? Rattling against the train and smashing the windows. It says that none of the soldiers were struck, but at least four civilian passengers were injured by bullets or fragments of bomb and glass. The injuries of three were not very serious, but here we have the details of the actual civilian casualty on the day. John Rossiter, he was badly wounded. In fact, he had his leg severed in the whole incident. And his other leg was actually damaged, injured in other places. Now we know a little bit about John Rossiter. Sadly, he is the father of 11 children. He was an employee of a man called JJ Parkinson, who was a well-known Curra trainer. And he, he was actually taking horses back from the races to the training um, establishments down in the Curra itself. Quite sadly to see a, a, a civilian caught up who's just doing his daily work and caught up in the whole incident in Ballyfermot. There's another account from the Leinster leader as well, which gives us a, a scene inside the train. So this can be quite graphic, but it just gives us an idea of what it was like on the other side. And again, the scene of the ambush, Ballyfermot Bridge. The party of rebels had made their preparations and the train appeared, some posted on the bridge as they're taking up positions on the embankment on either side of the permanent way. When the train reached the bridge, the signal for the attack was given. Heavy fire was opened from both sides at the soldiers sitting in the carriages. The attackers had placed the machine gun in position and drums of ammunition were emptied at the train, while some of them used revolvers and automatic pistols, other hurled bombs. We know they're the grenades. 
At some time, those who were stationed on the bridge poured petrol on the wagons and threw down burning rags in an attempt to destroy the military equipment. The destruction of the military equipment was pretty much as big a target as the Gordon Highlanders themselves. The soldiers returned fire leaning out of the windows. A wild panic took place among the civilian passengers. There was a hurled scramble for safety under the seats in the carriages. Those who were unable to secure this shelter lay prostrate on the floor and in some compartments of the train, as many as two or maybe three people were actually lying on top of one another. This is an account from the Leinster leader on the 16th of July. This is a number of days after the incident itself. This was the headline that accompanied the incident and this certainly wasn't the headline that they were expecting to, um, to see following the attack on the train in Bali Fermat. You can see it's the double headline. Peace conference resumed, train attacked near Dublin. They had expected the train attack to dominate the newspapers. They had an inkling that peace was in the offing. Peace was actually called later that day. So we get this wonderful headline marking the end of the War of Independence and the beginning of the truce era. It's the last major action of the War of Independence. The headline shocked those that were involved in the event. It was the last thing that they expected. They thought there might be a stop press announcing the incident on the train. Um, and the fact that the peace conference resumed hints at that the end is in sight. The end of the conflict is certainly in sight. And when it ended, it actually ended very quickly. The truce terms, fighting ceased. This is the Saturday newspaper. And it basically tells us that the restrictions are off from noon the following Monday. There's a nice little piece there in the middle. Uh, Tevilleur's message to the British Prime Minister, I am ready. So all of this, the guns are silent, there's better times ahead, the hostilities have ceased and the last action was the ambush of the troop train at Ballyfermot. And then pretty much it was nearly all over. The Irish hostilities were to cease on that day, official statements were released and the key players that are involved in this this time are Lloyd George and advice to the people of Ireland from Eamon de Valera. This is the Independent, the way it reported it, on the 11th of July. Michael Stack in his statement um, mentions this and in some ways he, he connects it to Ballyfermot. He said Ballyfermot incident was a glorious send-off for the active service union unit after a hard struggle against an enemy that was superior in strength and arms but not in courage. The truce was declared the following Monday. From May 1921, well of course we're, we're coming up on this anniversary of partition but it was going to happen because the act had been passed in 1920. The Government of Ireland Act that created Northern Ireland had already been passed. But with the coming of the truce of the 11th of July 1921, post-ceasefire talks commence. By December 1921, the Anglo-Irish Treaty is signed, effectively ending British rule in the 26 counties of Ireland. And by December 1922, the Irish Free State is created as a self-governing state with dominion status that's the foundation of the Republic that was to come. The six northeastern counties were to remain in the UK, but 
that was worse to come. And I suspect we would be talking about things that are worse to come in the next little while because we have a whole other story to tell all through 1922-1923. I just want to thank you all very much. I hope you enjoyed the talk and could follow the story as clearly as possible. It has been a voyage of discovery um, investigating the story, which all started with a small newspaper cutting, sparked my curiosity, called on the assistance of, of Liz, as I do for so many things, and between us we pieced it together to try and build the image of the events of that particular day in Ballyfermot, one the last Dublin action of the War of Independence. Thank you all very much. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Cathy. That was absolutely fabulous. Overall, too soon. <laughs> it was really enthralling. Time just flew. Uh, we're going to pass you back to, uh, to Liz, I think, who has been monitoring comments.